1969 U.S. Tennis Open is held at the West Side Tennis Club in Forest Hills, New York. Competitive tennis players travel over 50,000 miles a year in international tennis competition. My confidence doesn't really gain momentum uh, as, as I go along. Uh, I was very, very confident about five minutes after I won, and right now I don't have any at all. <laughs> Most of the tennis players are from the public parks, from a public park, park background. I think this is uh, where you're going to get your top players, and I think that the country clubs recognize this, and certainly uh, many of our uh, uh, racial barriers have been broken down. Well, I think it's great, uh, great athletes, great audience, and beautiful weather on the West Side Tennis Club. I think that uh, someday we will have carpets or some other kind of surface rather than grass. I think tennis will become a spectator's sport in this country, more so than it has been in the past. Changes that we need down the line are a better facility, better parking, uh, more more courts and uh, better protection for the courts in the event of rain. Ava is without a doubt the best player. It'll be uh, he's like an, a, the leader in the RBI department in baseball. He comes through in the clutch points. Yes, well, it's always difficult when you play Rod Laver. The tournament having been postponed due to rain, players and spectators anxiously await the sun to appear. Spearheading the action is South Africa's brilliant tournament director, Owen Williams. Thousands of American corporate dollars ride on Williams' experience in directing international tennis tournaments. Yes, we have been rained out for two days running now, and we have full houses coming up over the weekend uh, to try and keep the fans happy today, uh, to satisfy the sixty to seventy thousand dollars worth of advanced bookings we decided to call in a helicopter and fundamentally our main worry or the main worry of captain mike gibson the referee is the roche gonzalez match which is keeping us one day extra and i think with the sunshine coming out now plus the draft that we're having on the court is going to do the trick and we'll have that uh, worrisome gonzalez roche match out of the way today Soon, the rain clouds disappear, and the U.S. Open officials decide to proceed with the important fourth round. In 1923, this stadium was erected at Forest Hills. During the past three years, all previous spectator records have been broken with an attendance of over 80,000. It is considered the tennis capital of the Western world. Pancho Gonzalez is playing his 21st campaign as a pro. Once, his serve was the fastest in the game. He ruled the pros for a decade between 1953 and 1962, winning the U.S. pro title eight times. Tony Roach, one of the youngest players at 23, won the Italian and French amateur titles two years ago and the U.S. doubles last year. Tony Roach from Australia wins the fourth round. Open tennis, a relatively new concept in America, offers exciting innovations. The 1969 U.S. Open combines amateurs and professionals competing for the largest stake ever offered, $125,000 in total prize money. Traditionally, Experts have felt that in open competition, the pros would prove superior to the amateurs. However, a few of the brightest amateur stars have turned in stunning upsets. I just have to get myself worked up when I get on the court. You know, after you hit the first ball, the first game's over, then you're in there. You, you don't really think about 
playing with confidence. You just uh, you sort of uh, go through the motions. You, you react by instinct, by habit. Once you start thinking about uh, whether you feel like you're going to win, you're in trouble. You just have to go out and just react, that's all. Well, uh, the contract professionals have a guarantee so that if they don't win a match, they know that they're at least going to make X number of dollars a year. Uh, that, in a sense, is a little uh, uh, more of a uh, escape clause if they play badly. Uh, but again, the uh, players have the, uh, have the opportunity to play where they want. They have the opportunity to play in, in tournaments where there are not as many tough professionals, contract professionals, playing all the time. So I think it's kind of uh, it kind of evens itself out. Hopefully they'll they'll um, stop this uh, ridiculous uh, distinction between the two and just call everybody players or everybody professionals. In the men's singles quarterfinals, Tony Roach defeats Butch Buckholz from the United States, six one, nine seven, five seven, and six zero. Oh. Rod Labor from Australia competes against Roy Emerson, a fellow Australian. In a close match, Labor polishes off Emerson, 4-6, 8-6, 6-1, 6-4, and 13-11. Narrowing the competition in the women's singles, Margaret Court from Australia competes against Virginia Wade from Great Britain. Margaret Court is several times a winner of the four big titles. Virginia Wade displays an outstanding volley and serve. Margaret Court wins 7-5-6-0. In the final event of the women's singles, Nancy Ritchie and Margaret Court play it out for the championship. Nancy Ritchie, the queen of American tennis in 1968, won nine of her 12 tournaments, losing no matches or sets to sister Americans. wins to become the new United States Open tennis champion. The vice president of the United States, Spiro T. Agnew, presents the U.S. Open championship trophy to Margaret Court. Thank you very much, Mr. Coleman. Uh, it's indeed an honor to be here for this purpose and to have the pleasure of having my family and particularly my daughters, whom I'm trying to convince to become active tennis enthusiast that this is a great, as great a game as it is. I want to congratulate Mrs. Court on her win. It was a magnificent match. I think the key part of it came around that long game in the second set. 
at 3-1 when the lead went back and forth. It's a pleasure to see the uh, quality of the tennis we've seen here today. Thank you very much, Mr. Cohen. Mr. Martin, president of the USLTA, will present the other prizes to Mrs. Court and Nancy Ritchie. Mr. Vice President, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to present the trophy of $6,000 to the winner, Margaret. Congratulations. Now we have a gallant runner-up, Nancy Ritchie. President, I'd like to present the runner-up, Ms. Nancy Ritchie. Nancy, I think although you didn't win this particular match, I think we're all proud of your gallant effort. I think it's a terrific performance for an American lady. Now, it gives me great pleasure to present you the runner-up prize of $3,000. <laughs> The champion, Margaret Court, discusses her future travels in tennis competition. Uh, we'll be going out to Fort Lauderdale for about 10 days holiday, and then probably on to Los Angeles, uh, Berkeley, Las Vegas. We're not too sure yet, but I think I may have three more tournaments in America yet. As the men's singles draw closer to the championship event, John Newcomb competes against Tony Roach. and 8-6. This win puts him one step closer to the championship match. In the remaining semi-final event of the men's singles, Arthur Ashe, America's most prominent player, meets Rod Laver, world champion from Australia. Arthur Ashe has led his country's players by winning the National Amateur and U.S. Open titles in 1968. He restored America's self-confidence in tennis by becoming the first American to win our nationals since 1955. Ashe had this to say concerning the condition of the court. The one thing you do on a court like this is, uh, on a slow grass court, is once you get the ball in play, you usually play inside the baseline. Because, uh, first of all, the balls are very big. And after two games, the balls get big with uh, grass stains and with moisture. So you play inside the baseline to, uh, to, to uh, guard against a short ball. This is the first year the slam has been entirely composed of open tennis tournaments. Rod Laver competing for his second Grand Slam, the Championship of Australia, France, Wimbledon, and the U.S. exhibits an impressive volley. <laughs> Mr.
Midway in the match, the play is postponed on account of darkness. The next day, play is resumed. Laver wins, 8-6, 6-3, 14-12. In 1962, Rod Laver won his first Grand Slam as an amateur, equaling the 1938 feat of another great redhead, Don Budge. Defeated, Arthur Ashe reflects on Rod Laver's competitive style. This serve isn't, no, a serve is just better than average. It's, it's not comparable to, say, Newcomb's or, or mine, uh, or even Roach's. But, uh, well, he's a lot faster than Roach. He's not quite as strong. Uh, he, he has a little more variety than Roach, and uh, he has a better maneuverability. As Rod Laver and Tony Roach prepare to meet for the World Championship, the crowds enjoy the sporting atmosphere of the U.S. Tennis Open. The spectators and tennis personalities alike discuss American tennis and its future. Well, when you when you play on grass uh, on a grass court, the, uh, the the serve and volley is the main weapon. The ground strokes are very seldom used. But I think the uh, European clay court players uh, uh, are very adept at, at hitting uh, ground strokes. I think the American players suffer from the fact that, that we don't play on a slow court enough. And uh, consequently, it's, uh, it's important to get into the net, and especially on grass. You just try not to let the ball bounce on the grass. Well, I think that the grass court circuit is getting less and less because of the maintenance and so forth and so on. A lot of these clubs are going out of business because it's hard to keep a grass court up. But the grass court is being replaced by the synthetics and the uh, cement courts and the lake holes and, and the so forth. So we're still not getting back to the clay courts like they play in Europe. Well, in other words, the only way really you can get back to ground strokes would be to take some of the pressure out of the ball and, you know, so that the big serve and volley isn't uh, the weapon that it is today. I don't want to see it happen like that. I don't want to see it happen like that. You wouldn't like to see ground like strokes see back game. in the game? Play the same as it usually is. I mean, <laughs> one thing that I, since tennis is going to be on television as much as we hope in the future, how do we develop tennis personalities? Of I feel that uh, maybe the, the game, the rules should be changed somewhat to allow a player to express his, his feelings out there. I know Gonzalez expresses his feelings out there, and uh, I think that's what makes his personality. I definitely think the, the players are becoming a, a lot more uh, uh, well-known. Uh, they're certainly becoming uh, sports personalities that maybe uh, have not, will not match Arnold Palmer, Joe Namath, but certainly that uh, with the uh, influx in tennis interest, I think that uh, the names are getting bigger, and I think one of the reasons for this is the fact that our prize money has increased a great deal. I mean, people now winning $16,000 per uh, a tennis tournament, that's interesting to people. Before, it was two and $3,000. So I think that we are starting to build names, and I think that certainly we have enough personalities in the sport of tennis that you could de develop uh, um, characters out of these players. And, and uh, I definitely think that we have a, a great product to sell. It's just a matter of getting somebody to sell it. What did you We've think of Arthur Ashe's play? It. Everyone was very upset. Well, they saw two games, and it's pretty hard to come out with something like that going against you and then pull your game up and bail it out. It's a shame that uh, they couldn't have finished that la next to last set yesterday. It had been a better test, I think, for Arthur. Yes. He's a great player. I saw him at Salisbury. Well, I think it's the greatest game for competition, sport, uh, clean living, 
Have you converted uh, any colleagues? Oh, yes. We have some colleagues who play and enjoy it very much, and I love it. I play all the time. Played out here at the West Side this morning and hope to play until I'm 90, if the Lord permits. Do you? Oh, yeah, there you. Do you think this is a successful open then? Very successful. Considering the weather, very successful, Super yes. successful open. Very, and, and you notice the seating. They all came out exactly right, which was quite surprising. <laughs> I expected a few more upsets, and there were, actually, besides Tommy and Cliff, in the opening, there were a couple others, but it went very true to form. I think the youth is becoming interested, and I think even more important, that the parents are becoming interested. They can now see that Rod Laver is going to make $150,000 on a tennis court this year, and maybe another $150,000 off the court. So you're talking about financial stability for, for a youngster, and I think this interest a parent and instead of uh, handing the child a football or a basketball they might say hey you know why don't you try tennis the final men's well I'm just hoping we have a really great final that's all Rod Laver in the final singles championship match meets Tony Roach The match originally scheduled for Sunday is now played on Monday due to several postponements. Therefore, the attendance is not as large. Tony Roach, playing on three consecutive days without a rest, displays an energetic volley. Laver had this to say concerning his opponent. I'm used to using spikes, but uh, maybe Tony isn't. Uh, he does have a, a small uh, muscle that he, I think he maybe has, has tightened up on him. And he didn't want to use the spikes in fear to tighten up completely on him. So that, I guess, was the reason. With one game left to win, Rod Laver's chance for the Grand Slam becomes a reality. Laver defeats Roach, winning the 1969 U.S. Tennis Open.
Tony Roach reflects on Rod Laver's victory. First of all, it's always difficult when you play Rod Laver. You know when you go out there that you're going to have to play exceptionally well and uh, he's going to have to have a, an off day for you to, to win. And uh, now if uh, Tony Roach will please come up. I have a little pocket money for you here in the amount of $8,000. And I also have a little bill clip for you to keep your pocket money in. Please don't lose it before you get home. The most important event, the men's singles, proves conclusively that Rod Laver is the greatest player to date in international tennis competition. The following words written by Sir Henry Newbolt is symbolic of competitive tennis. To set the cause above renown, to love the game beyond the prize, to honor while you strike him down, the foe that comes with fearless eyes. I'm very happy to have won it.